Welcome to Snap Sessions, a podcast that looks at international artists and their creative pursuits, as well as interesting articles and broadcasts across the political spectrum. My name is Doug Nunn. I'm joined by voiceover colossus Ken Kraus, by our behind-the-scenes tech meister Marshall Brown, and by our artist activist of the show, British comic, poet, and musician John Hagley. Support for Snap Sessions is brought to you by listeners who contribute generously at our link, patreon.com forward slash snap sessions, or through the link in the Snap Sessions website, thesnapsessions.com, and also the link in our show notes. Thanks to our Snappus Maximus contributors, Ron Hoeksprung and Rick and Henny Newman. And to our supportive snappers, Ellen Athens, Peter and Sheila Jowers, Kathy White, Dominie Jowers and John Bird, Gabriel Geiger, and Christine Samus. Other contributors include Steve Weingarten and Jerry Shook. These supporters help keep Snap Sessions snapping. Join the Snap Sessions family. Yes, that's Horrible Histories doing their Billie Eilish parody, Precious Planet. It starts out with the words, Our planet, we should see the signs. We're damaging it over time. History, we must now rewind to undo our mistakes. Well, we wish we could. And that's what we're supposed to be doing at each UN Conference of the Parties, or COP, Earth Summit. In fact, we just had one. COP27 at Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt in November. And classically, COP was co-opted by fossil fuel companies, oil-producing autocrats, and political weasels of every variety. The Conference of the Party started out as the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in 1992. Overwhelming evidence had come to light over the previous years that Homo sapiens was the main culprit on global warming as it was then called, and a cavalcade of leaders from around the globe met in Rio that year. 1992, when we did Rio, was a very special year. It was a year in which the Cold War had ended. Uh, the uh, whole atmosphere was of the world coming together to resolve problems. First, I think it is uh, important to think about how much the Rio conference itself, 20 years ago, in fact achieved. Uh, it is, um, you know, exceptional in uh, international relations that a summit like that both decides on the uh, on a climate convention and a biodiversity convention and an agenda 21. People were excited. We had more NGOs there in Rio than had ever assembled before. Uh, we had more heads of government, pre- pre- presidents, prime ministers. Uh, as I said, a couple of kings uh, 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 than had ever assembled at any conference. The important thing is that we got agreement beyond what anybody thought was possible. At the end of the original Rio, somebody asked Morris Strong, uh, how many world leaders came to Rio? And Morris Strong's reply was, well, a hundred plus presidents and prime ministers came. How many of them were leaders? I don't know. The problem has been what happened afterwards which is not enough. Yes, it was not enough. But the UN did set up a series of conferences of the parties to continue their work in the hope that the world would continue to come together to work toward resolution of our shared planetary worries. By 1997, they had put together the Kyoto Protocol, which legally bound developed countries to emission reduction targets. Sadly, the United States Senate would refuse to ratify this treaty, and the U.S. would continue to be an outlier over the next decades. But finally, in Paris, at the end of 2015, 195 nations of the world met. At the Paris Climate Conference in December of 2015, 
195 countries reached agreement on the first truly global agreement to control greenhouse gas emissions and confront the impacts of climate change. The countries agreed to hold temperature increase to well below 2 degrees and to make efforts to stay below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. The emission reductions goals that countries presented so far would allow for a global average temperature increase of at least 2.7 degrees with potentially catastrophic impacts. The new global agreement includes national targets for 2025 or 2030 for most countries. In 2018 and every five years thereafter, there will be a review of what has been achieved by then, along with the future targets and proposed measures. This process will give countries an opportunity to increase their efforts and put forward stronger targets and actions. The Paris Conference was the great high point of planetary climate solidarity as various national leaders, including Barack Obama, signed the treaty. But then Donald Trump became president and pulled the U.S. from the treaty in 2017, and various other nations began backtracking and reneging. As we moved to COP26 in 2021 in Glasgow, Scotland, we could feel the backsliders and weasels moving against climate action. At COP27 in November 2022 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez gave delegates an ominous warning. In just days, our planet's population will cross a new threshold the eight billionth member of our human family will be born. This milestone puts into perspective what this climate conference is all about. How will we answer when baby eight billion is old enough to ask, what did you do for our world and for our planet when you had the chance? Excellencies, this UN Climate Conference is a reminder that the answer is in our hands. And the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. The UN chief certainly has our attention, but apparently not that of COP27. In fact, it appears that the hopes set out in Paris back in 2015 are being overwhelmed by business as usual. Fossil fuel representation is now running roughshod over the entire COP process. Let's give reporters from Now This Earth a chance to explain. There are so many fossil fuel delegates here at COP27 that honestly, it's kind of disappointing. Last year, there were 503 fossil fuel lobbyists at COP. This year, that number increased to 636. That's more than a 25% increase in just one year. And it's so shameful that we had imagined that this year would be better because we had called them out. Now these industries, which are the entire reason we're having these climate talks, have more representation than climate vulnerable countries that are fighting to defend themselves. But how are these fossil fuel lobbyists getting into COP27? And more importantly, how are they influencing negotiations? It's against logic. It's against common sense that the same people who are the climate criminals are the ones at the table trying to set the tone. At this point, the cops still allow the worst polluters and their government enablers to bask under a green spotlight, radiating a false impression of progress in climate action. As you heard, 636 fossil fuel lobbyists received delegate passes to the last COP in Sharm el-Sheikh. More than were given to the 10 nations most impacted by global heating. Fossil fuel firms had links with 90% of the sponsors at COP27. And who was chosen to lead the proceedings at next year's COP28? Sultan Ahmad al-Jaber, the CEO of the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, National Oil Company. I think at this point, it's time to admit that COP27 has been co-opted. We are being trolled, greenwashed, and astroturfed into planetary oblivion by fossil fuel companies, oligarchs, and dictators. Let's let John Oliver define astroturfing on Last Week Tonight. 
Astroturfing is the practice of corporations or political groups disguising themselves as spontaneous, authentic, popular movements. It's basically fake grassroots. That's why they call it Astroturfing. It's a very funny, very clever name. And the concept is like trolling or greenwashing. For more on Astroturfing, let's check in with Raleigh Williams at Climate Town. This is a classic example of an absolutely unhinged practice known as Astroturfing. Astroturfing, of course, is where a corporation or interest group creates and funds a separate organization that's meant to look like a grassroots movement, but is really just a puppet that blasts out whatever dumbass talking points the parent company wants. Coast to coast, the fossil fuel astroturfing machine is working round the clock to make it seem like real warm Americans not only share an oddly specific mutual affinity for rock juice and coal, but are also staunchly opposed to a clean energy transition. Actually, saying that international fossil fuel is astroturfing might even be saying too much. According to The Guardian, quote, while 2022 inflicted hardship upon many people around the world due to soaring inflation, climate-driven disasters, and war, the year was lucrative on an unprecedented scale for the fossil fuel industry, with the five largest Western oil and gas companies alone making a combined $200 billion in profits. In a parade of annual results released early in the year, the big five, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, BP, and Total Energies, all revealed that last year was the most profitable in their respective histories, as the rising cost of oil and gas, driven in part by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, helped turbocharge revenues. Why do they even need to own COP27? They already own the future of the planet, whether we like it or not. Now that Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans have a small majority in the House of Representatives once again, fossil fuel is back in power in the U.S. Congress. Many of these Republicans once publicly rejected the link between human activity and climate change. Now, quote, Denialism has been replaced by acknowledgement, although they are still struggling to identify policies to address climate change, unquote. According to Stephen Brown, a former fossil fuel lobbyist, McCarthy's number two, Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana, Steve Scalise will always be a rock star in the eyes of the oil and gas industry. Exasperated Senator Edward Markey of Massachusetts, co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, joined fellow Senators Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island and Benjamin Cardin of Maryland to beg UN Secretary General Gutierrez to, quote, take steps to ensure that the COP itself can avoid direct interference from corporate actors with a vested financial interest in undermining climate action, unquote. Enough fossil fuel interference in the future of our planet. The big climate change conference in Egypt is about to start. Now you condemned the last one as a failure and a PR exercise and, and you said that the leaders were guilty of decades of blah, blah, blah. Do you expect any more from this one? I do not, um, unfortunately. But as it is now, the cops are not designed to really change anything. Um, that's not why they exist. Uh, and right now it's like they are being turned into an opportunity for, for big polluters to greenwash themselves. Um, as long as it is now, as long as people, as long as the level of awareness is so low as it is now, then people will not be able to have the knowledge they need to put pressure on the people in power and then they will continue to get away with not doing enough um, and they will use words against us um, using greenwashing in order, in order to make it seem like they're doing something when they're not, using PR tactics and communication strategies disguised as politics. Um, so the way that COP27 would for me be considered a success or a step forward would be that more people realize what a scam it actually is. is. Um, under current circumstances. Thank you, Greta Thunberg. Yes, blah, 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 and more. More fossil fuels. Sadly, COP27 belongs in the Environmental Hall of Shame. Mm. 
Thanks for listening to Snap Sessions. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us on Patreon. We depend on the support of listeners like you. This is a song about when I lost my glasses. One, two, three, four. The place is unfamiliar. My face is bare. I've mislaid my glasses. Have ya? Yeah. And I need my glasses to find my glasses. But I'm going to be all right. Why is that? I've got a spare pair. I'm Doug from Snap Sessions, and we're here today with uh, an old friend, John Hagley, who is a Briton. He has been a poet, he has been a comedian, and a musician for many years. And I've had the good fortune to know John since 1985, actually, when I met John at a club up near King's Cross, and he was with a band called the Popticians. I welcome you, John Hagley, to Snap Sessions. Doug Nunn, thank you very much. We have begun. Yeah, (laughs) great, great. Now, I know you talk a lot about being raised in Luton. Now, Luton, as I recall, has a small airport, and it's northeast of London. Is that correct? I think it's northeast. Yeah, I think it's, it's about 30 miles away. We moved there. I was born in London, and we lived in a little flat. So my brother, Marcel, Rene Marcel, he's eight years older than me. So I came along and I was living in London for two years. And then my sister was about to come along and we moved to Luton because there wasn't room for three children. I see. And you claim French ancestry. Well, you said your brother's name was Marcel Rene. Your, your dad's name was Rene. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Rene Roberts. My grandmother was French on my dad's side and his dad was English. So that's why I've got an English surname. But grandma was French. Dad was born in France. French was his mother tongue. But unfortunately, he never taught it to me. So excuse me, French, it doesn't exist. I also read that your uh, grandma was a dancer with uh, Folie Bergeret. She was. Pronounce it as you will, Doug. She was. And then she came to, I think I sent you that song about them coming over to the United States in 1923. So dad was an older dad. Dad was born in 1905. When he was 17, he came to uh, uh, America with his mum and his sister. And uh, we don't know the whole story, but we know that she was on the stage in America. And dad worked in Chicago, Miami. He came back to Britain then in just in time to be your papa, apparently. Yeah, he came back. He came back in 1936. And then uh, my brother was born in 1945, me in 53. Yeah. Now, Luton, it's a dominant thing in some of your poetry and mentioned, I think, in some of your songs. I know you're a rabid Luton football fan as well. Tell us a little bit about Luton and, you know, the influence it had on the uh, Hagley life. I was brought up in a in a Roman Catholic school and taught by nuns when I was in primary school. And that was a strong influence, um, that sense of the sacred, which I've got to say I did miss when I went to my secondary school. I mean, I wasn't a particularly successful person in Luton, I would say. I was sort of, I hadn't really found myself and felt a bit unsure in my teenage years. I look back at those years now and I sort of, I suppose I'm sort of making, sort of trying to make a bit of a success out of him in retrospect by sort of writing about them. Well, it's an interesting place because, you know, it's provincial, you know, I mean, I'm not denigrating it by saying that no. it is i'm i'm a provincial boy too i you know i'm suburbs and uh you know living in the country now 
but it seems to be, it has a powerful influence on some of your work. And what about the Luton Football Club? Because what league is that in? I mean, it's not... Well, Luton are in what's called the Championship, which is the second tier of football. And we're doing quite well at the moment. It's a small ground. There's hopefully going to be a new ground built. It was, for me, it was when I was maybe 15, it gave me a real sense of belonging. So I sort of felt, struggled to feel that sense at school. With the football team, I really felt part of it and part of the crowd that went along to that and singing the songs and smelling the liniment. And you could actually smell the stuff that the chaps put on their put on the, their muscles. Oh, really? Oh, that, yeah. that kind of muscle liniment. Right. Interesting. So this was kind of, you know, a big deal before you went off to university. You worked for a while. I think you worked as a bus conductor or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we moved. So we moved from Luton in 1970 when dad retired. He was 65. Then we moved to Bristol and I became a bus conductor in Bristol. Before I went to university, I was on the buses only for three months. And then before that, I was a civil servant for nine months. Bristol, I basically flowered to some extent because I found that I could entertain. People thought I was funny. It gave me a, a place which I didn't really have. I hadn't really found that so much in Luton. I mean, I'm fond of my I'm fond of uh, my time in Luton, but it was a developing time. And I suppose I felt I'd developed to some extent in Bristol. And then I went to Bradford University, had my first girlfriend. I was a slow developer with uh, partnerships. I didn't have my first girlfriend until I was 20 in Bradford. And that was Pam. And that is who the poem Pat is about. But I changed the name, but I don't think I changed it enough because it sounds a bit similar, Pam and Pat. Right. Well, you know, as long as you mention the Pat poem, um, that is on one of the poems. Uh, I think there's 14 poems on the Saint and Blurry album. And um, the Pat poem is, is quite a lovely poem. And uh, it has kind of an abrupt ending. I said, Pat, you are fat and you are cataclysmically desirable. And to think I used to think that Slim was where it's at. Well, not anymore, Pat. You've changed that. You love yourself. You flatter yourself. You shatter their narrow image of the erotic. And Pat said, what do you mean, Fat? Maybe tell us a little bit about it. Well, it was about Pam. And I think Pam used to sort of sometimes sort of think that she needed to watch her weight or keep an eye on it. And I thought she didn't. She was fine as she was. So it really just came out of that, really. You know, it's like, um, I like you just the way you are. Yes, I get that. And it, it comes out and it's a lovely little piece. Now, so you were at university and um, at the time, I'm assuming you, did you already know guitar? Because you play mandolin as well. Did you already know guitar when you were there? Yeah, I played guitar, I, uh, but when I was maybe 18, I was playing it. And I remember thinking, though, because I wasn't playing it to start with, because I remember seeing Tony Price playing in the sixth form common, common room. And I thought, how can he sing and play at the same time? But I did learn. And when I was in Bradford singing, one of the first songs I sang, well, it was the first song I sang, actually, I, I picked up my guitar so this is a this is a cavaquinho, not a guitar. And I remember singing, my mummy, she bought me an armadillo. I kissed him and I kept him under my pillow. And I called him Armadeus, the armadillo. <laughs> and that's something that I've sung since 1973. And I made it into a song. I just sang those few lines to start with. But I remember just sitting there and singing that. Um, so I could play. That was very early on. I'd only been there a few days. So, yeah, the main has um, always been something that's in my shows. I did a show once where I didn't bring my instrument along. And my brother says, where's your guitar? I think I think the music, I think it needs the music. Yeah. I think I think that's one of the things we'll, we'll talk in a moment about, uh, you know, the music and the popticians, et cetera. But um, when you started out it, in comedy, I'm assuming... I know you were early on with uh, John Corn, Otis Cannelloni, in the Brown Paper Bag Brothers. But did you start when you started doing the alternative cabaret scene? Did you start at the comedy store doing tryouts and so forth? Uh, yeah, I mean, when well, I started on the streets. I mean, I was a street performer. I was a street entertainer. 
Um, that's how I started. I was busking. And then I went, went to Interaction uh, and did the children's shows in 1978. That was the first time I was hired. And that was run by Ed Berman, an American. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think Ed Berman is on a boat now, still doing community theatre. It was a community theatre group. And Interaction... I sent you that little clip about something I'd sent out as my publicity, that the interaction thing that they had is something that has remained with me. And so I've always had interactive performances. Uh, Again, the Comedy Store was, I think, was 1980. So I had the songs. That did bring up my comedy skills, I've got to say, and uh, ways of dealing with an audience that perhaps gave you a little bit of jip, as we call it over here. I don't know what you call it. What do you call it? What do Americans call the... It when people give you a bit of trouble, heckling, you mean, and so heckling, forth. Heckling, yeah. yeah. Has you got a word for it? Well, um, you, they, you know, they give you a hard time, a heckle, and so forth. I know uh, when Tracy and I were working uh, in Britain, it, there's a lot more heckling in Britain than there is in the states. We, as a double act, we had a little bit of trouble dealing with it because it would be like, <laughs> who responds? Uh, should yeah. I deal with this left flank, and they're attacking on the right now? What do we do with this? And uh, that beer bottle just missed me, and I try to block it, etc. We we weren't as good as I would have liked to have been with heckling, but yeah. And I think a lot of people like yourself. I always always Otis Cantalone does a great job with hecklers. I think he just sloughs them well, off. Well, I mean, it's just like in a conversation. The fact that you re- it's just about responding. It makes the thing now. It makes it a live situation. Just respond to it. And don't overly worry about always saying something funny. It's you know, it's like a conversation. Just you don't have to worry about being clever or funny. Just respond. Now, I thought when I first saw you uh, working with Otis, I think the Brown Paper Bag Brothers saw soon after I saw the Poptician. So, I had seen you with a band, and then I saw you with John Otis Cantaloni. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Brown Paper Bag Brothers and the kind of act that you have had you still do it occasionally we work together um we haven't done the brown paper bag pieces but we've done we did a show last summer together with youngsters uh it was a well a family show um young and old folk come along the brown paper bag brothers so john and i were both working on the street at the time and we went to do a show together in edinburgh with the Popticians and Otis Cannelloni, because we spent some time together, John and I started to generate a few things together. And he came and said, but we sing, like he's in love with a brown paper bag. And John would come on stage and be the one who was in love with the brown paper bag. And he would share his love with me. Uh, but I couldn't take it because I was already in love with a light blue envelope. But uh, it was nice that he showed, offered me his love. <laughs> Then the brown paper bag routine developed out of that. And in 1986, we took that show to Edinburgh. We'd still do a bit of our solo shows. That was a very interactive show. We would hand out brown paper bags to the members of the audience. And I would get inside a very big brown paper bag. And I say I was going to escape from my spectacles, my eyeglasses, as American folk call them. And uh, John would get somebody to come in and take a Polaroid photograph to make sure that I was still wearing my glasses and I hadn't taken them off inside the bag. Then I, that, that person would come out of the bag and I would inside the bag, try and escape from my glasses and fail. Fail miserably often, as I recall. Very happy failure. Yes. Now, um, you still wear glasses. I wear glasses. I've got them here, but I don't yes. always wear them for close up. So I don't have them on. I know um, no. I know you as a, a spectacle lover. Um, or probably somewhat like Doug, put on your glasses. What are you doing? You're, you're you got your own rights, man. Okay, great. I appreciate that, John. I really do because I know I love many of your glasses, songs, and poems, and uh, they are a strong part of your acts over time. Yeah. And this brings me to um, the first time that Tracy and I saw you, which was at this um, pub in at King's Cross. Ivor Dembina was running the show and. I got to see the Popticians for the first time. Do you guys still perform? I'm just curious. Uh, we haven't performed at, well, we did it last summer. Uh, again, that show I did with John Otis, Sue and Keith were there and they came and sang Brown Paper Bag and John came on with the Brown Paper Bag. So we did a bit of the Brown Paper Bag Brothers That's and wonderful. the Popticians all in one. That's great. Now, the Popticians, I looked things up, you know, as you do. And um, I saw the Popticians were first brought to um, public renown on uh, the John Peel show. 
for um, the Yanks who don't know who are listening, um, <laughs> John Peel was a long time famous guy for bringing on various bands and getting them exposure. And then sometimes they'd take off and then he'd bring them back, you know, after having discovered them or whatever. And the Popticians were on, I think the first time, 83 or 84, something like 83, that. 83, yeah. Yeah. And you guys did a song about glasses. I loved the band. It was kind of a a little bit punkish. are unusual so are the shorts when I say the shorts of course the belt is so what I mean and there's much more to a sumo belt than just a kicking up your jeans apparently the referee has a ceremonial knife and if he makes a wrong decision he can take a little life away Sumo, 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 sumo Harikiri Sumo, 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 sumo They can eat a horse And then another Very much hard to describe. You had Sue on saxophone you had a drummer and I think a guitar player yourself on mandolin. And there was there a bass player as well. Tell us about well, the did, when you saw us 85. I don't know if Nick was with us. So Nick, was, when we had a bass player, that was Nick and Russell was on drums. I was playing guitar, actually. And Sue on sax and Keith on sax as well. Yeah, because Nick joined us in I think it was 1985. It was a four piece in on this on the Peel sessions. It was a four piece 1983, 84. Now, um, you did songs about glasses. You did songs yeah. about dogs. Uh, you did um, some stuff about Luton. And then this morphed into an album, Saint and Blurry, which I think I mentioned to you uh, in our correspondence leading up to this, that um, I got a cassette tape of Saint and Blurry, Saint and Blurry, and I played it and I played it and I broke it. And it just so <laughs> happened because I had played it so much that Tracy had an extra copy and she gave it to me. Oh. So I ended up playing that and I broke that as well. I have to say Saint and Blurry might be my favorite obscure album. For those who <laughs> don't know about uh, this particular album, it has 14 poems on it, I think, as well as numerous excellent tunes. It starts out with Train Spotting and uh, Train Spotting of course we all know the the movie with Ewan and McGregor you know, about yeah. the her heroin addiction. Okay, so some of us were It doesn't mean we're local So hold your tunnel vision, will ya? Please, will ya? So we called it Train Spotters slightly ah, so ah. you can tell the difference. Train Thank spotters. you very much. Thank you for correcting on that one. You got together with that. Um, I think that's a real work of art. Talk to us a bit about putting together Saint and Blurry because it has so many different influences, the poems, the songs, etc. Yeah, what you know, you Joe Boyd got us to do that as Joe is credited on the, the record, um, who did um, a lot of marvellous music. And he got Nigel, who's my friend, and uh, Isabella, my daughter's godfather, to be the producer. And Nigel had all right, done a course in um, music production, so he knew what he was doing. And 
it was really lovely to sort of have his, uh, and also he's a w- wonderful guitar player and a guitar player on Train Spot. I'm calling it Train Spotting myself now, Doug. Sorry, uh, sorry, John. No I problem at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. I like the way it comes together with there'll be a song, there'll be a couple of poems, there'll be another song or two. And um, you get through it and you really hear about this world, glasses, dogs, Luton. There's a variety of things. And one of my favorite things in life, and as I've talked to uh, dozens of artists now for our show, is how the artist brings you into their world and said, this is what I'm interested in. I was wondering, you know, we've talked a little about glasses, but tell us a little about dogs and some of the other things that you like to write poems and songs about. Well, it's, I was thinking about this earlier on, actually. I was thinking about it in the bath, Doug, and I thought, what is my angle in this chat that we're going to have? I thought, go on the front foot a bit, because I was thinking, no, Doug's going to ask me this, and he's going to ask me that. And, what do I... and then I thought, what am I trying to do? And I suppose I'm trying to be funny sometimes, but sometimes trying to be funny and trying to trying to say something as well. So the dog poems, sometimes there's a little bit more than the dog. There's the owner. Who is the owner? And the glasses, sometimes there's a bit more than the glasses. So there's one I wrote about glasses, which was called Glasses Good, Contact Lenses Bad. Yes, I love that. So that goes, I hope I can remember it. In the embrace of my glasses, I openly accept my vulnerability and affirm the acceptance of outside help, as well as providing open acknowledgement of the imperfection in my eyesight. My glasses are a symbolic celebration of the wider imperfection that is the human condition. In contrast, contact lenses are a hiding of the fault. They pretend the self-sufficiency of the individual and minister unto the cult of stultifying normality. They are that which should be cast out of your vision. They are a denial of the self. They are a denial of the other. They are a betrayal of humanity. Wonderful. I love that. And, you know, I can't help but agree. And I proudly I'm holding up my glasses. By the way, they're sort of a dark blue. I've got a pair of dark blue glasses. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, beautiful. That very similar. John and I are both holding our glasses to the Very similar. Yes. And um, it's it's on the audio, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be on the audio. It'll be the glasses will be on the audio, which is a good thing. I have never been able to wear contact lenses and I tried, but this whole business about sticking something in your eye, yeah. and, oh, just it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's exhausting to think about. I mean, it scares me actually to, to do that. Yeah. It's nasty. Yeah. And there's something about, I know that you coming from the land of national health glasses, you probably had some rather nerdy looking glasses growing up as a child. I really liked those national health glasses. Yeah. Nice, yeah. nice, nice design. When I first went to England, I thought to myself, I saw many people proudly wearing national health glasses. And there was something about it that I thought, I like these people. They're honest about their glasses. And then, of course, the band became the Popticians, which was which is very cool. Anyway, those are just some things I wanted to check in on. And uh, Luton, dogs and glasses. Do you presently have a dog? No, um, no dog at the moment. We had a cat, Ella. She lived till she was 20. So we're we're creatureless at the moment. Ah, yeah. We have here a cat living here. Uh, and then the back house where my uh, stepdaughter and her kid and uh, husband live has another burly cat, a guy who has a uh, black and white, one of these uh, tuxedo cats, I guess they're called. And then they recently got a bunny rabbit named Sparkle Girl. What's Carl- your cat called? Uh, this this cat here is called Crowley, and the one in the back is called Punch. Punch is a burly little tough guy, and Crowley's a very feminine feline, I wish, guess you would say. Um, yeah. Feline personification of Audrey Hepburn, I think. It's nice to have, That's nice to have that wandering around your place. Yes, it is. It is. So speaking of pets, I had to... The bunny is quite remarkable, though. I've never been around bunnies that much. And this one, you go by with a Brussels sprout and a carrot, and that bunny is banging on the screen, wanting to get at it. Really quite a little cute little creature. But anyway, I digress. So, uh, (laughs) um, so, you know, you've been performing for years. I regularly have read your stuff in The Guardian, too. I've been um, 
coming back to the States, I've stayed in touch with The Guardian and gone back to England as much as possible. How did you land that gig being a sort of a Guardian poet? Because Roger Alton, the editor of The Guardian Weekend, knew me and thought that maybe the poems were worth an airing and gave me that opportunity, which was a lovely opportunity to put every week. Sometimes it was a bit of a struggle to, I put in a new piece. I didn't use old pieces. It loosened me up. It got me having to, yeah, as, as you know, having a deadline, you got to do it. And you have done, you've done uh, over the years, you, I've spent a lot of years doing it regularly. Do you, are you an occasional contributor at this point to The Guardian? Yeah, very occasional. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, I saw the recent one, I Am a Guillemot, uh, which in the children's section, I believe. And we'll play that for a while here. I am a guillemot, I use my bill a lot. I get the fish out of the wet, I eat my fill a lot. I live on ledges, vertical edges. Eating wise, I do not know what veg is. Don't you give me sherbet? Give me a turbot. My appetite for fish I cannot curb it. I am a guillemot, I know the drill a lot. I drill into the drink and get the drink and not the ink upon my quill a lot So you don't thrill a lot Well, listen humans, very soon you will a lot Did you know that I can go so deep I've been seen from the porthole of a submerged submarine 130 metres under? I don't think so Miss it and blink so I come in hard and I'm able to sink so I am a guillemot I do my specky recce from my rocky windowsill a lot I am homeless, but I'm not gormless. I can go so quick, it's almost like I'm formless. I am a diver, ocean arriver. Underneath I go, I am no skyver. I don't do nesting when I am resting. I can sleep while I am standing on one leg. And so it doesn't roll off when I stretch my wings or stroll off. I've got an egg that is conical and eccentrically weighted so it don't fall off the edge of the cliff face into the water with all the jellyfish and all the other fish I am a guillemot I find the fishes tend to lose one meal a lot but I take only what I need I'm not a greedy bird I'm sustainable self-restrainable I am a guillemot, am I not? Well, the I am a guillemot song came from my friend Tony, for, who lives in Bristol, who um, said, yeah, you like glasses, you'll like this bird. And he showed me the bridal guillemot, which looks like it's got a pair of white spectacles. And I said, you're right, I do like that bird. And it's a fishing bird. So I sort of studied, found out some information about it and thought, I'm going to have a go at writing a song about that. It's a, it's a lovely little piece. You go into schools now and then, and um, you do workshops with kids. Um, yeah. Uh, talk about the uh, kind of poetry workshops you do with kids. What is a typical Hagley kid poetry workshop? Well, I often do. We make a poetry, and I'm not the first person to think of a poetry. We make that, and that's got um, some some dogs at the bottom, and they provide the bark, and the elephants, we draw them as well. They provide the trunk. Um, so that's part of the tree. But I often use a poem by Adrian Mitchell called Yes, and it starts, a smile says yes, a heart says blood. When the rain says, and I ask the children then to think what the rain might say. What do you think the rain might say, Doug? Uh, smile says yes, the heart says blood. When the rain says, what might uh, it say? Nurture. Love. Nurture. Nurture. Yes. Nurturing. Yes. Yes. Okay. It, uh, well, it, be, it begins with dr. Smile says yes. The heart says blood. When the rain says dr. Dr. Draw. Draw. So where well, you get a load, you get drizzle. You get drizzle. Drizzle. There we go. It's not, it's not drizzle. You get you get drizzle. <laughs> you get drip. You get dribble. Yes. It's drink. A smile says yes. The heart says blood. When the rain says drink, the earth says mud. And then we make our own verses of that. And perform them, and then I sometimes sing them. Actually, that's a really lovely thing. Write them up on the board. The kids go off into groups. 
write those poems, write their verses, bring them together, write them up, sing them. I see. So you get them singing along with you by the end? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm glad I wasn't in your workshop because I would have cocked it up miserably uh, with what I, with <laughs> my response. <laughs> you, tr- so you know what the main thing is, though, Doug? You, yeah. try it, you yeah. did it with commitment. Yes. Well, you know, I think it's a wonderful thing. How you start the workshop in that particular instance, you do lots of kids' workshops around the country, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there any particular age group that you specialize in? Yeah, I think so. A 10-year-old's is a good age group. Actually, somebody asked me to come in to do the under fives, and I said, it's not really my strong area. I said, I'll come in and read them. I've got a a story for under fives. Well, it's really for four to six-year-olds called Stanley Stick. And I said, I'll come in and I'll read that to them. How often do you do you head into and do children's workshops these days? I, th- I think I've got a couple coming up and then I've got four adult workshops in March and April. So I guess it works out at maybe pro- probably only sort of eight, eight or nine a year. Mm-hmm. And then maybe five adult workshops a year, maybe. So mm-hmm. no, there's not that many. But I think having it sort of not too frequent, I hope it keeps you fresh and alert and alive. Oh, what 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 are some of the differences between doing a kids workshop and doing an adult workshop? Is it mostly also poetry? Do you do it? Is it a similar way you approach the uh, workshop? I, I like to get everybody drawing, adults and children alike. And I think the probably the, the bits that are the, the same are the most important bits in a way. I'll do the um, Adrian Mitchell poem, the Yes poem. We do that with adults as well. Get them to draw dogs as well. I think the I think what I'm aiming for a workshop that is for everybody. Yeah, that comes through. I think. I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I I suspect how how long are they? Just I'm also curious about that because uh, kids usually an hour, adults hour and a half, two hours. That's the difference, Doug. The yeah. length. Yeah. The adults are longer then? Adults are longer. Yeah. They can last longer without starting a mini riot or something like that. They're more tolerant. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good. I'm just curious because there's a, a certain style that comes from doing workshops. I've been doing improv workshops for now uh, 35 years or something like that. And um, I actually get a lot out of it. I come out of it energized and kind of upbeat and happy. Do you feel similar? Yeah. Well, as you said earlier on, when we were talking earlier on, you felt you had a good liaison with people through the workshops. Yeah. Ideally, that's the same for myself. You feel as though you've achieved a connection. Yeah. And connection is nourishing. Yeah, I I would say so, too. And then occasionally um, in a workshop, do you find yourself uh, putting on the brakes and turning in a different direction? I mean, do you get inspiration in the moment and then head off? Yeah, well, you've got to be, you know, we all know that as performers and as as creative people that you've got to try and be taken to other places to discover for yourself. So you welcome those. I mean, obviously, you, you only got so much energy, though. So you, you sort of you go back to the old favorite tracks for a while, don't you? Sure. But you welcome a meander. Yes, you do welcome the meander. That's true. And that's kind of fun. It also is kind of the stuff that you remember when you go back, you think, oh, I'll, maybe I'll use that again or or yeah. in, in that particular yeah. instance. I also wanted to bring up the um, Edinburgh Festival. I know you've been a regular performer at the Edinburgh Festival. And I wanted to bring this up partly for American audiences, because one of the great things about Tracy and my time in Britain was going up and doing the Edinburgh Festival. Every year, it's still August, right, uh, John? Yep. Okay. Yep. In August, it's almost like uh, a good portion of the performing community based in and around London migrates north like a migratory bird of some sort, all of them almost seemingly go up to Edinburgh, Edinburgh and Scotland becomes just this performance, art, creative wonderland that has literally hundreds and hundreds of performers and artists get together and they do a variety of shows. Uh, All these venues are booked, all these hotels and lodgings are booked, et cetera. 
And it is one of the liveliest scenes on the planet. And um, you're a regular there. And I wonder if you could tell us typically what you might do when you're up in Edinburgh and the kind of stuff that's come to you over the years. I was thinking about that last year. And I, I don't have an all new show. I don't think I've ever gone up with an all new show. But I like to have one thing that is the thing that I want to bring up, it, it, even if it's only a small thing. And last year, it, it was about saying how important it is to give a little bit of encouragement, basically. It's important to, and to say things to people. If you like them, tell them you like them, you know. But being at the festival, you get like last year, I saw a group of women R Rwandan drummers. Now, I ain't going to see them very regularly. And so that was fantastic to see them. It's an opportunity to do a run for a performer. So normally, I'm out doing a one night stand shows here and there. So that's lovely to develop a show in a space and know a space. I know folk up there. If I do it this year, it'll be my 33rd. I've done 32 festivals. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's a small number, Doug. I yeah. mean, Simon Munnery did his 30th show eight years ago, and he's 14 years younger than me. Wow. And as I say that about Simon, another performer, you, you're aware, you know, you, I see Simon. Simon and I went out and walked across the meadows together last year, and I hadn't seen him all year before. So yeah. You get a chance to see other fellow performers. I mean, I've seen some amazing shows. You see a, there's wonderful theatre there. I saw Tirano de Bergerac, a performance of that. And honestly, I, I thought I'm going to, because I knew the story. Yeah. And when he comes on, I don't want to spoil the story for anybody who hasn't seen it, but I thought I'm going to weep and I'm going to, you know, they're going to have to kick me out because I, it's just going to be so humiliating sobbing in this. Yeah. It's an emotional, passionate place. Yes. I recommend it. I don't know if you've got, a, I mean, I did Aspen Festival when I was in, uh, that's my only time I performed in the United States was at the Aspen Festival. Uh -huh. And that was really lovely, actually. Yeah. And one thing you don't get the chance to do is to go skiing. I was the worst of the skiers. I could, they wouldn't <laughs> let me go onto the into onto the tough slope. They they were very polite to me and they said you just got to stay down here because I was a safety risk. <laughs> That's great. You know, the Edinburgh, you mentioned two things. I love Edinburgh. I think it's a great place. You've done poems about Edinburgh, a variety of them, but you also mentioned Cyrano de Bergerac. I might be my favorite play. I, yeah. I, you know, I had a thing uh, when I was in ninth grade, which is 14, 14 years old, I was in a, a class and I was kind of a boob and a bit of a nerd and uh, awkward around girls and the like. There was a new teacher and she had just been a student teacher and she came in and she taught us Cyrano de Bergerac. And at the end of the time, she gave us an essay. She made us do a lengthy essay test. She was fresh out of Berkeley and she wanted to prove her teaching spurs, you know. She gave us a really hard essay and that was on a Friday. And then on Monday, she came back and she had corrected them all. And here I was, like I said, a nerd, kind of a doofus sitting in the back of the room sort, sort of thing. And she starts talking about there's only one person in this class who understands Cyrano de Bergerac, who understands what love truly is, who understands what he means when at the end he says, I brought to the world Pinoche. And she says, that boy is Doug Nunn. Woo! I almost fell off my chair. For one, I don't think there was a girl in the classroom who believed her, but there was also this feeling of like, you know, I was like, holy mackerel. So that play was actually quite a, a life-changing thing for me. And uh, as I've seen more recent versions, the one with the great French actor, a uh, burly guy, um, Depardieu. I love that version, and I think it's wonderful. But even Beautiful. the St Steve Martin one where, you know, it's all about Roxanne, it's good. It's just a lovely story. Yeah, well, I, I saw that, the, the film also, and that's, as I said to you, I knew the story from seeing that film. Yeah. And then I saw it at Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh in the 90s, and it was a Scots dialect version. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, you that's... can find it, Doug, but by Edwin Morgan. Edwin Morgan. Um, I'm right Edwin it down. Morgan. Okay. And it, it, Tom Mannion was played Serrano. Honestly, it was just phenomenal. And that was an opportunity. And I've had opportunities to see things in Edinburgh that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. So you're not only a performer, you're a member of the audience as well. 
Yes, that's the great thing too about Edinburgh is how much you get to see over the course of the, say, three and a half weeks you're there or whatever. Tracy and I were on stage, I think, 28 or 30 times in the three weeks we were there, yet we managed to see probably 30 shows. It's a real kind of a culture building between your ears. It's just wonderful. I wanted to ask you about a few of your poems or I guess poem songs. One of the things I like um, is Potato. And what we'll do is we'll play a bit of potato. I'm not a normal person, whatever that may be. There is something very, very vegetable about me. This human skin I'm skulking in, it's only there for show. I'm a potato. When I told my father it was something of a blow He called me a dirty so-and-so He kicked up quite a racket He grabbed me by the jacket I said, Daddy, will you pack it in? Won't you help me grow? Won't you love me for my blemishes And look me in the eye? Before one of us is underground and the other says goodbye And he said, no, you're a potato When I was a schoolboy, I never knew why I was so useless at cross-country running But now I know why I was so slow And why they put me back in the sack race I'm a potato. Yeah, but um, it's a it's a great thing. I think you've got one version where you're sitting on it looks like your um, little porch, and playing yeah. on your mandolin. And I think there's also a version with a tuba playing behind you. Oh right, that's Keith. Yeah, Keith. It's right Keith from yeah. the Popticians. He went. He yeah. moved on from the moved on to the saxophone. and got went on to bigger things. Doug. There you go. Um, tell us about potato and your feelings about the spud. Well, the potato, it's a sort of like the dog. It's the kind of the, the archetypal, even though it's a very exotic vegetable. To me, it seems like a very grounded, ordinary vegetable, even though it comes from Peru. And the dog, to me, is the sort of the basic animal. And the spud is the basic, although the potato is incredibly versatile. And in that song, it, I try to take, well, that was what I was saying to you earlier on. I've tried to move it on. So I'm talking about the potato, but I'm trying to talk about something else as well. And it's a nice short one, and um, it's pretty, and it's musical. And the way you say it, you know, in fact, that's a question I'd like to ask of a poet. You know, a lot of it has to do on how you deliver the poem. In that particular one, it's a short poem. Um, perhaps on paper, it does, you know, I don't even know, half a page maybe. But it's the way you punch certain syllables, etc. How do you decide to do that? To some extent, it's not a decision. It's something that comes about. I feel a bit ignorant. I've never discovered Maya Angelou. Oh yes, and I had, and I've only just discovered her this week. This last week, actually, somebody wow. showed me one of her poems, and somebody like this today sent me because I was talking about her, and I read them one of her poems. My friend Sally sent me a version of her recording one of her poems. I can't remember which one it is, but it's what a performance. I'd never seen her before. And I thought, what a performance. And I can't imagine that she would do that the same each time. But there's yeah. so much goes on in her performance. Yes. How much gesticulation goes on. So it's not just your, your words. It's, yeah, gesticulation yeah. and punctuation. I think that that's one of the things that when I was looking at a lot of the stuff, you know, to research the Hag Hagley oeuvre, as it were, I'm, I'm fascinated that it, there's a lot of variety in the way you do things. And I think that's a wonderful way to be a, a poet. You're a musician, you're a poet, you're a comedian. You add those things together and it's going to come out differently each time. And I think one of the things that I thought was wonderful was that you sent me a poem called um, I Believe, I think. I believe yeah. in you, or is it I believe? That was beautiful. It's a serious poem on one level, but it's also, it's the kind of poem that makes people feel better. Well, uh, it's nice you say that. 
Thank you very much, Doug, for saying that. Um, I'm just looking for it in this book. Maybe I should see if I can remember it. Maybe there we are. That's all right. Let's see if I can remember it. I believe in you. I believe in you being close to me. I believe in you being close to me intimately. I believe in you being close to me intimately regularly. I believe in you being close to me intimately regularly, just not today. I believe in you being close to me intimately regularly, just not today, because sometimes I need to be with myself alone all the better to be with you more intimately. That's lovely. Did I miss a bit out? No, no, no. Not according to the version I have. I was peeking (laughs) at it just then. Oh, that's beautiful, John. It's a lovely poem. And, you know, it just goes to show the multi-sides of John Hagley. As we'll play over the course of the interview, we have some silly songs. We have some silly poems. And we also have some very intimate personal things. And I think that's one of the things I like best about you. I've enjoyed over the years seeing you perform and having a laugh. I was watching just before I I connected on this Zoom call, I was watching I Need You, which looks like you might have performed that in Edinburgh. I think, I don't know what performance, but I know that there is one that was in New Zealand. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was in a big hall, big hall. Yeah, I think that was in New Zealand. I think it was. And that's also a lovely piece. And I think you're on mandolin in that one. It's in sort of um, Hagley-esque in a certain way, if I could use that word. <laughs> it just sounds kind of fancy, but, you know. It might, it might have been, I can't remember now, it sounded flashy, but it might have been Melbourne, actually. Mm-hmm. That song, um, and that's a song that I use that form to get people to write things for workshops sometimes to get them I right thought I need you like a this needs that you know I need you like a pair of glasses needs a face you know I need you like a and when I was doing that with some children a 10 year old lad he said I need you like OCD needs perfection oh wow for a 10 year old kid to say that that's amazing that it really is yeah 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 uh, do you have anything else <laughs> that you would like to add and particularly at this point well, I'm sort of quite interested in the improvisation. I mean, we spoke about because improvisation is something that I failed at, right? I tr- I tried, and I really failed at it. And there's nothing wrong with failure. You you know you realise. But I'm interested um, what you would do in that. I mean, I I gave you an example, right? Of that little poem that I do that just to give me an, an example at what you would something you'd start with to get the ball rolling with an improvisation thing, what would you do? Well, one of the things that's classic, for example, yesterday I was doing with uh, my high school students. We have the Mendocino High School Improv Club. I still do that regularly. One of the things we play is the importance of saying yes. That is done by a game where you make a statement and then I say yes and, and then I add something. And then you say yes and, and then you add something. So, for example, go ahead and make a statement about what you maybe want to do today or something. I'm glad that you've got two cats, Doug. Yes, and they both live here on the property, and surprisingly, they get along. Yes, and a lot of cats don't. (laughs) Yes, and this is especially amazing because one is so burly and mannish, and the other is so petite and Audrey Hepburn-ish. Beautiful. So do you realize, though, because my poem that I suggested that I work with kids is called Yes as well, Doug. Amazing. Yes by Adrian Mitchell. That's the name of the poem. Yeah. And the two can be side by side. Yeah. You know, that's a wonderful thing. And it, it is it is a way to get things going. And as they say, oftentimes there's no rules in improvisation. There's just certain things that you hope for. And one of the things is to orient yourself toward positivism and and in that way the yes and game helps so that's one we generally do at the beginning somewhere at the beginning of of workshops but one of the things i like the fact that you and i both do workshops and tracy does too and i know a fair amount of other performers who do and something good comes out of it and i think it's sort of nurturing for both of us when we did that with that i need you poem and the child came up with that it was it was a fantastic thing 
So that I need you poem as an example is one that is in bits and you put everybody's bit together. There's 26 kids, 26, I need you for this. I need you like this needs that. And that big poem, you know, even though one might not be quite as good as another one, be 25 if you don't have the other one. Well, that's wonderful. I appreciate the chance to talk to you, John Hagley. I want to say that my goal will be to get this out probably in late March. We do one show a month, so we're not exactly, you know, pounding the pavement. But uh, my big hope is, is that they're all fairly special. So okay. it was, in fact, wonderful to connect with you again. And I, I, show you, I didn't show you my, my cardboard creatures, Doug. I These, love um, them. Can you see what they are? Yeah, they look a little bit like, um, well, monsters or doughy people. They're crabs. Crabs. Look. Okay, right. They've Look. got the crab hands. Look, Doug. Oh, that's great. He's making the eyes move back and forth within the crab, and that's a wonderful thing. That's great, John. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I love to end on a visual note in an audio show, so that's a good thing. <laughs> John Hagley, it's great to talk with you. And Thank I you, think Doug. Very Thank much, you very for much spending an hour with snap sessions. Thank you. Merci. Merci, monsieur. They can call me softy, as softy as they please. But still I'll stand by these, my little optical accessories. They stop me walking into lampposts and trees when it's foggy and I'm out walking with my doggy my doggy don't wear glasses so they're lying when they say a dog looks like it's oh I've seen people with blood on their glasses Once I saw a lad who had the leg of a daddy Long legs on his glasses You've got to clean your glasses If you want to see Thanks to our artist of the show, British comic, poet, and musician, John Hagley. Our production team includes tech meister Marshall Brown, Jack of All Trades Ken Krause, writer interviewer Doug Nunn, and our logo designer, Daniel Stieglitz. Don't be an airhead. Get out there and do something creative. Dabble in something that inspires you. Read something challenging. Expand your perspective. Our aim is to give you an international outlook on the arts and a critical look at world politics. Salute the power of creativity and foster international solidarity. Make Mother Earth great again. Support for Snap Sessions is brought to you by listeners who contribute generously at our link 
patreon.com forward slash snap sessions or through the link in the snap sessions website the snap sessions.com and also the link in our show notes thanks to our snappus maximus contributors ron hawksprung and rick and henny newman and to our supportive snappers Peter and Sheila Jowers, Kathy White, Dominie Jowers and John Bird, Gabriel Geiger, and Christine Samus. Other contributors include Steve Weingarten and Jerry Shook. <laughs>